Good day from ChemHelp ASAP. In this video, we will perform a Hunch thiazole synthesis. This is one of the very old reactions in organic chemistry. The video description contains links to supporting documents, including the laboratory procedure and proton NMR spectra. On the screen is a model Hunch thiazole synthesis. Let's start with the product. This five-membered ring with a nitrogen and sulfur is called a thiazole. This molecule satisfies Huckel's rules and is aromatic. It is very stable. The starting materials for this reaction include a ketone with a halogen, X. It could be a chlorine, a bromine, or an iodine on the alpha carbon. The other starting material is a thioamide, which is just a regular amide with a sulfur in place of the oxygen of the carbonyl. When these two reagents are heated together, the first step is an SN2 reaction between the sulfur of the thioamide and the alkyl halide at that alpha carbon. That gives this intermediate There are different resonance forms that we could draw for this. I've chosen to draw the positively charged sulfur. At this point, through several steps, the nitrogen will do an intramolecular condensa condensation. We'll lose water and eventually HBr as well to get the thiazole. The aromaticity of the product is important. These reactions are normally run with some heat. The reaction has the energy to explore its various intermediates and eventually find the stable aromatic product. We can show this on an energy axis in the bottom left. So we start with our starting materials and then we explore various intermediates in the pathway and eventually we're going to find our very stable aromatic product. The reaction is very easy to perform. It involves available starting materials and forms stable products. For these reasons, the reaction was discovered back in the early days of organic chemistry, back in the 1800s. On the screen, we have the exact reaction we're going to perform for this, uh, for this experiment. And it's going to start with, on the far left, 2-bromo-acetophenone. And our thioamide source is actually thiourea. So flanked on both sides of the SO double bond, we have NH2 groups. And then we're going to heat these up together in methanol. It's going to be our solvent. And we get our product. Now initially, when we perform this reaction, we're going to run it, and the initial product, stable product, that will form is actually the HBr salt of our product. So we're going to have not a thiazole, but a protonated thiazole. And this is, this is going to be uh, fairly soluble in methanol. What we'll then do, once we're confident the reaction is done, we're going to react this with a weak base. It's going to be sodium carbonate. It will deprotonate the thiazole. We'll then form a neutral product, the thiazole as shown as our product. And that will be insoluble and will precipitate out of solution. Now, one last comment. When we run this reaction, we're going to use about 5 millimoles of 2-bromoacetophenone and we're going to use a little bit more than that of the thiourea, about 7.5 millimoles. Now, even though we use them not in a one-to-one -one ratio, the fact is, in this reaction, they do react in a one-to-one -to -one ratio. So we have a slight excess of the thiourea. This is pretty common for people to use an excess of one of the reagents, especially when the excess reagent, and so at the end of this reaction, we will have some thiourea left over. The thiazole will precipitate out, 
that's supposed to be a precipitate. While the thiourea will remain soluble. So even though we used excess thiourea, it's really easy to get rid of the excess reagent. And so in, in situations like this, it's common to use an excess or reagent to help get a higher conversion in your reaction. So that's our, our basic reaction. We're going to take 2-bromoacetophenone, react it with thiourea, and we'll eventually precipitate out our thiazole product. Fantastic. At the balance, let's get started on our reaction. We have to weigh out our reagents. Here's our first reagent. This is bromoacetophenone. This is a nice free-flowing solid. I think it'll be pretty easy to weigh out. Here is a piece of weighing paper. I've crimped the corners to make the weighing paper a little bit more cup-like. And let's tear the balance with the weighing paper on there. Now, very often when you weigh out materials on the balance, you might get a microspatula. But for something that's nicely free-flowing like this, I think we'll do all right just by tapping it from the container. So we want about 995 milligrams of this material. And if we can get within 20 milligrams of that, that's within a couple percent of what we need, I think we're doing just fine. So that's about 200 milligrams. Let's go a little faster. That's about 600 milligrams. There's a big chunk, that's fine. We, we have enough room to accommodate that. 890. Tap, tap, tap. Just real gently. Oh, we went over. Now, this, oh, so, so this is 1.021 grams, or 1,200, maybe 22 milligrams. That's a little more than I wanted, but that, that's going to be good enough, and we'll see why later. But that's, you know, that's within maybe 3% of what I wanted. We're a little bit over. Not a huge problem. Now we'll take this material, and that is, we'll call that, 1.022 grams and that's just a little over five millimoles of that material. Now let's get a fresh weighing paper. Let's tear this and now let's weigh our second reagent. So this is thiourea again a nice free-flowing solid. We want about 571 milligrams of this material. It's about seven and a half millimoles. So again we just need to get close and write down exactly what we used and we weighed out not what we wanted to get. So again we're aiming for 571 that's almost 500 right there. Fine that's we'll call that 583. 583 milligrams of the thiourea. It's going to be just a touch over seven and a half millimoles. Great! So there are two starting materials mixed together. They're not going to do anything until we add solvent and heat, but we're close to getting started. Those are all the reagents we need for this early part of the reaction. Okay, in the hood we have a uh, hot plate in front of us. We have an aluminum pan with just a little bit of sand. Maybe, I don't know, half an inch tops of sand on a hot plate and we've dialed in at about 100 degrees. Not everybody has hot plates that have temperature gauges on them. I, I just said this is very low heat. So if you have a hot plate that doesn't have a temperature gauge, I'd certainly say a heating level of one is certainly going to be adequate for this. So here we have also our nice scintillation vial, 20 milliliter scintillation vial with our two reagents mixed in here. What we're going to do is we are going to add approximately five milliliters of methanol to this. And we'll throw in a stir bar to get everything mixing. And finally, I'm going to put a cap on this. Now, I'm just really going to place this cap. This cap is still loose because we are going to heat this up. And in general, it's very poor practice and unsafe practice to heat glass containers that are sealed or any vessel, vessel that's sealed. So this is just uh, something to minimize airflow across the top and minimize evaporation, but we are not 
sealed by any means. There's, uh, if we get expansion in anything inside the vessel, then we have a place for uh, pressure to release. So let's get this stirring. You can see this is trying to boil a little bit. I'll just put this right on top of the sand. Our point is not really to boil it, although it's okay if it does, uh, gently. Our point is just we want to heat this gently. It doesn't take a lot of energy for this reaction to go. So we'll just let this stir gently on this warm sand, um, and we'll give this about 30 minutes to react. And then after that time period, we'll come back and we'll move on to the next steps. Well, we are now 30 minutes later and the reaction looks very much the same. It is still stirring. Everything is dissolved. It's been heating for approximately 30 minutes. And um, while it looks like nothing's happened, I'm very hopeful that the reaction is done because 30 minutes is about the reaction time. So we'll go ahead and take this off the heat and let it stand. And while that's standing, we're going to need to add um, or mix this with some sodium carbonate. So I'll get that solution made up. And by that time that's done, this should be cool. And then we'll uh, see if we can precipitate out our product and that our product is formed and we'll get it out of solution. Well, here is our reaction product. And here is a solution. This is about 20 milliliters of 5% sodium carbonate. So that's about a, about a gram of sodium carbonate solid dissolved in 20 milliliters of water. Now what we're going to do is we're going to mix our solution. This is our product in methanol. And the product at this stage, there's an equivalent of HBr in the reaction. And so that has protonated our product. And so this is actually a salt. It's a hydrobromide salt of our product. So that's going to be very soluble in a polar product solvent like methanol. When we mix these two, we're going to mix our hydrobromide salt with a little bit of base, the sodium carbonate, and that's going to neutralize our product. So we're going to go from a charged organic molecule to a neutral organic molecule, and hopefully our product will then precipitate out a solution. So one thing is happening, we're neutralizing the molecule. The second thing that's happening is we are pouring this into a more polar solvent. So water is more polar than methanol. And that's also going to be another factor that will help our product precipitate out. So, here we go. There's our base solution. And let's dump this in. Try not to obscure the view. And there it goes. Everything's precipitating out. That looks great. Now, we'll take care of the residue in there, but let's swirl this around. That is some nice, thick, solid formation. Let's take this and rinse it with some water. Just to see if we can get every bit of our product out. But this looks really nice. Okay, good. Now we'll give this another swirl. I don't know if you can see, that is just thick, thick, thick with precipitated solid. Okay, that looks wonderful. So we're going to let this stand for just a little bit. And the next step is that we're going to isolate our product by a filtration. All right, here we are. We are ready to filter. So we have set up in the hood a sidearm flask, a filter flask, and it has a rubber adapter, and we have a Buchner funnel. Here is our paper that will go into the Buchner funnel. Now this solution is essentially water. I know there's a little bit of methanol in there, and, but basically it's water. So we'll use water to seat our filter paper. And when it seats, we'll want to make sure that all those holes are covered by the filter paper because the filter paper is a little small for this funnel maybe. We can get everything covered. Looking good. Everything's covered. Now before you filter, you typically want your vacuum on and now down the hatch we'll filter this material you can see that has great flow we want to collect as much as this as we can it won't be perfect but um, let's just try to do the best that we can now, by rinsing out this beaker, we're doing two things. One, we're getting the last of the solid out of here. But we also, as we dump this liquid into the funnel, we are rinsing the solid, the, the filter cake that's present inside this funnel. 
uh, because there, there are salts in here, there's uh, hydrobromide salts and carbonate salts, and we want to make sure all that rinses off, flows through the filter cake, and then it gets collected as waste in the bottom. But we want all those salts off of here. So let's give it one last rinse just to be sure. Dump it through. Note that we wanted to collect the solid. When you want to collect the solid, you typically use a Buchner funnel and a suction filtration. If you, if you want to get rid of the solid because you want the liquid, typically you use a, a gravity filtration. Depends a little bit on the nature of the solid you're, you're filtering, but that's, those are the, the general ideas you see in lab. So this looks great. We have it filtered. Uh, all the liquid has pulled through. We'll let this stay on the vacuum for a little longer. We'll draw some air through this solid and let it dry a little more. Anytime you're filtering water, it takes a little longer to dry because water has a pretty low va vapor pressure compared to most organic solvents. But we're going to let this air dry and then we'll transfer it to a watch glass. And here is a watch glass I'll transfer it to. This has been pre-weighed. We have a tear weight on this. It's about 6.95 grams. And then once it's dry, we'll get the mass of the solid, subtract out the mass of the watch glass, and we'll have our final product mass. Okay, back in the hood. And this, uh, our product is now dry. It's sitting on this watch glass. And when we just subtract off the mass of the watch glass, then we find that we have 903 milligrams of our product. So this is our dried product. Now, wh while this product looks really nice, um, it's nearly colorless, it's a nice, well-behaved, dry solid, just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. Formally speaking, this is a crude product. We did not recrystallize it. We, we just forced it to crash out of solution, but we didn't dissolve it and then re-precipitate it. So this is has not been recrystallized. It certainly hasn't been distilled or chromatographed. So this is a crude, isolated product. And so while it looks nice, and my sense is it will be a fairly pure material, um, we'll have to let the other data speak to that. For example, the NMR, the melting point, and the TLC. So we'll we'll get some characterization data, but right now this looks good. And 903 milligrams is, is I think, going to turn out to be a really nice yield. So we'll have to do the calculations and then look at the data and see how everything matches up. So with the reaction complete, let's go ahead and figure it out, figure out our percent yield. So 2-bromoacetophenone, this has a molecular weight of 199.04 and I'm, instead of writing that as grams per mole I'm going to say that's milligrams per millimole and let's just look at thiourea. Thiourea is 76.12 that's milligrams per millimole and then finally our thiazole has a molecular weight of 176.24 milligrams per millimole. Now we know that we used 1.022 grams of the bromoacetophenone. This is 1,022 milligrams. If we divide this out, we get 5.13 millimoles of bromoacetophenone. If you remember in the video, I was trying to wait, get five millimoles and I overshot that number a little bit so we have 5.13 millimoles. For the thiourea I weighed out 583 milligrams and if you divide that out 583 divided by 76.12 you get 7.66 millimoles. As you can see, the bromoacetophenone, this is our limiting reagent. Since these two reagents react in a one-to-one -one ratio, we're going to run out of the bromoacetophenone first. Therefore, at most, we're going to get 5.13 millimoles as our theoretical maximum yield. Okay, now let, let's see what we got. Uh, so we weighed out 903 milligrams of our product, 
And if we divide that out, we find that we got 5.12 millimoles. So this is our actual yield in terms of millimoles. If we then divide actual by the theoretical times 100, we get 99% yield. It's actually like 99.8%, but I'm not going to say I got 100% yield because you just don't get 100% yield. Now, how do we deal with this? It's not very likely that I really got a 99% yield. Well, remember, this is technically a crude product. We have not purified this. So before I pat myself on the back and say, hey, I just did an awesome job, let's see what the rest of the data say. Um, but th this does look pretty promising. And again, not to pat myself on the back, but there's a reason why people discovered this reaction back in the 1800s. It works, and it works really well, even with very limited technology. So this, yield, this reaction ought to work with a pretty high yield. I wouldn't expect 100%, but you know it's um, it, it, it's a very good reaction. So let's now look and see what the data say. Do the data back up this idea that we have a pretty good product? This is our full NMR spectrum. So the full spectrum. It has a ppm ppm range of all the way greater than 15 ppm down deep into the negatives, I don't know, minus four or so. So this is a full, what they call the full spectral window. And uh, what we see is not surprising. So we have this benzene ring. Those are going to be five hydrogens off the benzene ring. That is technically an aromatic hydrogen because that thiazole ring is aromatic. And this NH2 is a little more exotic than a typical NH2, and it's actually pulled down towards the downfield region as well. So remember, downfield is more on the left. And so really, this is all the action from our compound. Now there are other peaks here. You know, we have these two things, but keep in mind we are in DMSO as our solvent. DMSO D6 is deuterated DMSO. So at approximately a, a chemical shift of three and a half in DMSO, we have water or the residual solvent signal for water. And at about two and a half, this is, um, we're not 100% protonated uh, or deuterated on DMSO. We have a small amount of DMSO that has at least one hydrogen on it. And we see that residual signal in there. So both of these peaks on the right are from our NMR solvent. They aren't part of our molecule. So let's instead now just zoom in on this aromatic region and see if we can pick out the finer details of our compound. We are now zoomed into just, this is the downfield part of our spectrum, and it, it, because this is where we think all of our hydrogens are showing up. So let's go ahead and put all our hydrogens on our structure. Let's label these A, B, C. Note that by symmetry those would also be B and C and then D and then finally the NH2 protons. Okay, so the in total I've indicated five hydrogens on the phenyl group and then six for the thiazole and then seven, eight if you include the NH2. And if we look at our integrations we have two here, two here, one, two, and one. So all eight of our hydrogens seem to be showing up. So that, that's a great sign. One other thing I'll point out is look how clean this baseline is. This material does look very clean. And in fact, if you went back to the full NMR spectrum, you'd see that also looked very clean. So it, it does, this is a high yielding reaction and the product is, looks reasonably pure by NMR. So let's now try to assign our hydrogens. And let's start with, let's start with the C hydrogens. So these two hydrogens, each of those hydrogens has one neighbor. And by symmetry, those ought to show up together. So we would expect those to show up as a doublet. And sure enough, 
here at 7.8 ppm, approximately 7.8 ppm, we have a two hydrogen doublet. So I think these are, this signal is for the C hydrogens. For B, each of those hydrogens has two neighbors. Each B hydrogen is a neighbor to an A hydrogen and a C hydrogen, so they ought to be a triplet. And by symmetry, they're identical hydrogens. So this should be a two hydrogen triplet. And that looks to be the signal between 7,3 and 7,4. So I'm going to label this for B. Now for signal A, this ought to just be one hydrogen. A has two neighbors, the, the two B hydrogens. And so that ought to be a triplet, because it has two, two neighbors. It's a single hydrogen, and this would appear to be the A signal. And now how about the D hydrogen? The D hydrogen has no neighbors, and it's a single uh, hydrogen. So that, this here's our single hydrogen with no neighbors. It's a singlet. That's its multiplicity. This would appear to be D. And then we get to the E hydrogens. Now, I think most people probably have less experience with NHs, but these NHs, by symmetry, are, they're the same signal. So we have a two hydrogens. It's a single, it's a little bit broad. That's a sign of having um, an NH or an OH, an exchangeable hydrogen. And so we're going to label that as E. Now, you might say this is a little fishy because maybe there's something going, you know, both the C and the E hydrogens. Um, those are both two hydrogen signals, and you could think, uh, what if the NHs show up differently? Then maybe instead of being a doublet on the far left, this is actually two singlets that come close together. And maybe for some reason our C hydrogens don't show up as a doublet, they show up as a triplet. And so maybe I've actually swapped C and E. Is there a way to test and see if we have this right? Well, as it turns out, there is. And this is a really, I'm going to talk about a really cool experiment. It's called D2O and shake. And that's literally what people call it. I'm not sure that's a very fancy name, but that's what people say. So we're going to treat this molecule. We're going to take our NMR sample, and we're going to add a little bit of D2O. Now, when we add D2O, hydrogens like NHs and OHs tend to exchange with the D2O. So this NH2, those protons, the Hs, will exchange and become an ND2. Now, we're doing proton NMR. And what do we see in proton NMR? We see the proton signals, the protium signals. H1 is the protium nucleus. If we put deuterium there, deuterium is not visible in a proton NMR spectrum. So if, if what I'm saying is true, when, if we exchange those deuteria, those hydrogens, those protea, for deuteria, then we should see this signal, this E signal should disappear because those are now deuterium atoms instead of, uh, the, the, instead of protons. So let's see on the next slide, let's see what this looks like. So on the screen, we have our regular proton NMR spectrum. And on the right, we have our D2O and shake experiment. Now, these, these spectra aren't identical. The vertical scales aren't identical. But we're not worried about the vertical scales. What we're worried about is which pre peaks are present. So, we have 2, 2, 1, 2, 1 on the left-hand spectrum. That's what we saw on the previous slide. And now we have 2, 2, 1, 1. This peak is gone. So th that peak, which corresponds to this signal right here on the left, this was what we assigned as our NH2. Now, in our spectrum on the right, this is now an ND2. We exchange those hydrogens for uh, those protium isotopes for deuterium isotopes. And since deuterium doesn't show up in a standard NMR experiment, that signal is now gone. And so that's evidence that we correctly assigned those peaks um, properly. This is this D2O, 
D2O and shake exercise is really useful because sometimes peaks overlap and you think, I think I have an OH there, but I'm not totally sure. Add a drop of D2O, shake it up, take the NMR again, and if it disappears, that's evidence that it was an OH or an NH. So we really didn't need that help on this spectrum. This is not a complex spectrum by any means, but it is a nice example to see some of these other tricks that people use in NMR. It's not just about count up your hydrogens and make sure everything's there and the chemical shift is reasonable. There are other tricks that help you unravel and identify which hydrogens belong to which signal in these NMR spectra. And this is just one trick. There's a whole ton of them. But uh, as you do more NMR spectros spectroscopy, you will learn additional tricks. So let's consider our TLC and melting point data. On the screen is an image of the TLC plate. Kind of hard to see. And that's where the, the spot was introduced to the plate. So that distance, A, equals 2.5 centimeters. The distance from the dot all the way to the solvent front, we'll call that B. And the mobile phase traveled 4.6 centimeters. And our RF value for this is 0 0.5. 5.4, keeping in mind that an RF value by itself is worthless. You need to know the identity of the mobile phase. And that mobile phase was 50% ethyl acetate, 50% hexane. So this is one spot by TLC, and uh, there's really nothing else you can see. So uh, like the NMR looks clean, the TLC also looks clean. Now let's think about the melting point. Our lit melting point, and this was reported as a melting point, not a melting range, is 151 degrees, and there is our literature reference. When I took the melting point, the experimental melting point, reported as a range, I got 148.6 to 149.6. So a nice tight melting point in reasonably good agreement with the literature value. So this does appear to be a clean product. Now, how do I explain a 99% yield? Because I, I got to admit, you, you just don't get 99% yields. Well, there are other things that impurities that can be in a compound that won't show up in the NMR spectrum and won't show up on a TLC plate. You know, we use uh, sodium carbonate as the base. If we had some salts in our, in our product, it, it wouldn't show up by, in a proton NMR, and it wouldn't show up by a TL, in a TLC plate the way we uh, visualized it. So we could have some impurities in here. However, the melting point being fairly tight range indicates if we have impurities, it's not going to be very much. So I, I would have to say this is a very high yielding reaction. And um, the, well, whether it's completely 99%, it, I would say it's certainly 95% or so, at least. So it's just a, it's a really good reaction. So this is, a, and that's why this reaction goes back over 100 years, um, you know, close to 150 years. So this is, this is the Hanch thiazole synthesis. It's one of the earliest organic reactions, and it's just, it's a great reaction. Uh, very simple to reproduce and get really nice results with this reaction. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe, like, or leave a comment. If there's another experiment you would like to see, then definitely let me know in the comments section. Handouts for the procedure of this experiment and the NMR spectra are available through links in the description. Thank you for watching. Take care.